Hello and welcome everybody to a new video. So this is uh, going to be a little bit of a follow-up video uh, from a video I did a few months ago sometime, or was last year actually, jeez, this was a long time ago, um, where I made an STM32 dev board, uh, which is one of these little guys here, uh, and the video today what we're going to be talking about is this new one who I, that I have here. So this is my second STM32 dev board that I've made. Um, first one used an STM32L chip. Uh, I have now moved to an STM32F chip. Um, talk a little bit more about why later on. Um, so this video, I'm going to take you through a little bit about this board, a little bit about the design, some of the differences from using the old chip. And more importantly, I'm going to go talk about the programming environment that I have set up here, which is using Rust. Uh, very similar to what I did before, but there's some subtle differences and some new libraries that I'm using. So we're going to talk about that too, a little bit about the debugging procedure uh, and all of that stuff. So if that sounds interesting, stay around. Uh, we're going to talk through all this stuff. Um, yeah. All right. So let's jump straight into it then. Uh, first thing, I'm going to show you a little bit about the design that we have here. Uh, so this is the new design, very, very similar to the old design, as I said. The board is actually slightly bigger than my old ones. It's a little bit wider. The actual chip itself, the little black square in the middle here, is physically bigger than what I had on my previous board. Uh, so for that, the board, I've made it a little bit wider, so it, uh, on a breadboard, it takes up a little bit more space. Uh, this chip also, by being physically bigger, it has more uh, GPIO, so it has more physical pins, and they're all broken out uh, here, of course, on the board, um, and so that makes the board also a little bit longer. So it's wider to accommodate the physically bigger chip, and it's longer to uh, accommodate all the different pins. So the differences between this chip and the other chip, um, not a huge amount. Uh, it has a little bit more uh, memory and it has a little bit more, uh, sorry, it has more RAM and more flash memory. Um, and it has a couple of more features that the other one didn't have. So for the basic features, they're pretty much all the same. It doesn't do a huge amount more. Uh, it has more ports, obviously more pins, so you can drive more devices off it, connect more stuff to it. Um, and it also supports some different oscillators and stuff, which is a little bit different, not a huge amount. Um, in terms of the circuit board itself, it's basically all the same. Um, I have a new oscillator, or sorry, I have the same oscillator on here, the same uh, low speed uh, external oscillator on here for doing accurate real time clock stuff. Uh, that's exactly the same as it was in the old board. There's a few extra capacitors because there's more power pins. So I have some more capacitors here, decoupling caps for the power supply. Uh, and there's one other cap here, which is needed for, um, this is unique to this bo uh, board compared to the old board. You need to connect this to this uh, V cap pin. Uh, and that is not sure exactly what it does. I think it's something to do with, um, uh, it's like a tuning, external tuning thing for the uh, internal voltage regulator for it. I'm not exactly sure, but I think this is part of the minimal circuit anyways to have this connected in here. I do have it and it works, so <laughs> it's fine. I don't exactly know, but it works. Um, layout of the board then, yeah, it's all pretty straightforward. I have a kind of the chip laid out, you know, at 90 degrees. The old one I had it at 45 degrees, um, just to do with the way the pins are connected on this, to break it out, to fan it out in this nice kind of way. It just worked out easier to have it in that orientation. It also takes up less physical space between the uh, headers if you do it this way. So it's, uh, that's why I did it this way. Um, so yeah, that's about it for the, the, uh, the chip itself. Um, next thing, I guess we'll talk about a little bit about the uh, software and the stack I'm using. So I mentioned that this is an STM32F chip. The old one I was using was an STM32L. Um, now the original version, the choice to use an STM32L, uh, there wasn't really any particular rationale that went into that. The reason why I did it was... Uh, it was the first STM32 that came up on JLC PCB's part picker that had uh, lots of stock, so I just picked it. Um, I believe now, in hindsight, the L version of these chips is actually meant to be sort of ideally optimized for low power applications, so um, very low power uh, circuitry that uh, has like, you know, will sleep the chip and that sort of stuff. That's what that's optimized for. Not something that I specifically need to optimize for in any of my designs. So there was no real reason to pick that. Um, but the real key came for me with, uh, as in the key to change to a different chip, came to me with the software stack. So I am using Rust to program all of uh, this stuff for the microcontroller. And 
the Rust libraries, the HAL library for this. So if you see here, this is where I import that SEM32 F, uh, F, uh, F4XX. So this is just a version of the chip HAL library. So it's basically the SEM32 F li set of libraries is far more up to date than the STM32 L libraries. Uh, reason for this is that the F series of chips are far more commonly used than the L series of chips. So the people who have maintained these libraries have kept the F series of chips way more up to date. There's constant churn of new uh, PRs and new updates to the, the, the structure of this library that just aren't happening over in the L series ones. So I was finding that as I was trying to do stuff in the L series chips, uh, I was looking at some of the the uh, the APIs and I was getting confused because I was trying to do stuff that I was finding in the other APIs and it just was, wasn't there. And it turns out it was because it's just not really being maintained. So I figured <clears throat> designing a new dev board, swapping over to STM32Fs would be better future proofing for everything. So that's why I did it. Now, I guess we talk a little bit about the code itself. So this is our main program that we have in here for uh, that we're going to run. So this is our test program. Uh, it is basically a, it's the hello world that I like to call it of uh, embedded programming. It's a, just a blink thing. So turns an LED on and off. Hence why I have an LED on this board. Uh, unfortunately my little programmer is too short here. So if I'm, when I'm demoing programming this guy, uh, I won't be able to, won't be able to see the blinking LED. You just have to trust me that the LED is blinking. Um, but yeah, the setup for this really, really simple. Uh, in my main file, uh, I've got a few use things up here. Don't really need to worry too much about these. These are basically all um, uh, pulled out of the sample for this. So I'll link to the library below that I'm using for this. And this is a pretty much carbon copy of what their sample code that they have for Blink and LED. There's a couple of differences. Uh, this Panic RTT target uh, library that I'm using, uh, this does a slightly different uh, operation uh, when if something panics, if you know, if you're a Rust programmer, you know what panicking is, but it's basically like a, uh, an unforeseen error that you can't recover from. So there's different ways you can handle that. Uh, within uh, this guy, this does a specific way of handling it. There's other ways you can handle it. There's a, a very common library that's used for this stuff called panic halt, uh, which just halts the microcontroller when it panics. Um, this will do a different action. This will do some logging and stuff for me. Um, and yeah, that, that, that's all that is really. This is just importing our basic dependencies. And then if we go through our main application, we init our uh, printing thing, which is uh, RTT is the debugging platform that we're going to use for this. You'll see that in a second when I connect the debugger. Uh, and then we've got uh, some setup stuff here. So this is just uh, setting up our peripherals. And um, it does this in like this uh, little if statement here where you can... Uh, so this is basically if, if you can connect to the peripherals, so it is effectively checking that the state of the chip is set up correctly. You connect to the peripherals and then everything else happens inside here. Uh, so very simple stuff. We pull out uh, the GPIOs, GPIO port A, and then here we're gonna pull GPIO <clears throat> port A pin five, uh, take it out into this push-pull mode, and then we have that as our lead pin, <coughs> which we will then toggle on and off later, excuse me. <clears throat> um, other stuff we're doing down here, then we're setting up our clock. So uh, there's different ways you can set up the clocks. Uh, in this particular instance, I'm setting up the RTC, which is the real-time clock. Uh, you have to have the crystal external crystal oscillator set up to run the, RT, um, the RTC. You can use the internal clocks. There's config for that available, but uh, in my instance, I want to test my external oscillator that I have set up, so I'm using that. <clears throat> the way you know it's working is if you try and do this, it will fail if the external oscillator isn't um, set up and working. This succeeds, so uh, I know that I've done it right. Um, we can set up a little delay here, which just uses uh, one of the built-in timers. Um, and then we hit our main loop. So this is uh, the loop in Rust, the loop uh, statement, which will just loop for infinity. So as long as the uh, microcontroller doesn't uh, encounter some state that it can't get past, it will just loop for infinity. Uh, it'll print to my uh, debugging terminal, the word toggle. It will toggle the LED 
uh, a different state so it'll toggle either on or off on or off and it'll wait one second in between doing that and it'll just do that forever just blinking an led forever so uh first thing i can do if i connect up my programming board which i will do here in front of me and then over in my terminal i can use the uh cargo uh, command the cargo embed which sets up the which will do all the things so this will do is so compile the code if it's not compiled it will then communicate with my uh programmer my sd link programmer it'll then send the code over to it it'll then start debugging it'll open a, an rtt debugging window and you'll see our debug statements coming so if i hit enter doing all the things writing the code out and there we go and now it's running so do you see here this is my config stuff for my statements here starting configuring clocks configuring timer and then it's toggling <clears throat> on and off uh, once every second or so and you can't see it <laughs> but the there's an led in front of me which is toggling itself on and off <laughs> uh, matching that pattern uh and yeah that's about it that's 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 our, our setup there so i can also have this set up uh, if i put a breakpoint here and I press my F5 key, uh, and this will do the exact same thing, except it will output in my terminal here inside uh, VS Code, and it'll also drop me onto this breakpoint where I can see all the variables that I have set up here, and yeah, just debug this as if it was the same as any other application. I can step over or step into, uh, and I can just play it and let it go. And yeah, and that's there. We go. There's our toggle statements uh, running down there. So, setting all this up uh, can be a little bit uh, finicky. There's 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 quite a bit of stuff you have to do. Um, I'm not going to go into all of the details, but I can give you a little bit of highlight. So in my README here, you can uh, check this out for yourself. So obviously, I'll link my code in the description. But you need to do a few things. You need to have uh, stuff installed with Rust up, which is uh, basically how you uh, manage your Rust versions. Um, also, I should say this is all uh, I'm running on a on, on a Mac here, so this is all Star Nix style stuff. Would be similar if you're using Linux. I don't know how to do any of this in Windows. <laughs> Unfortunately, I can't help you there. Um, so yeah, you can you have to install these some of these tools. Uh, you need to add a new target. So this target here, this is the architecture that we want to target, which is basically let us uh, actually compile stuff for the ARM architecture of the SCM32. And then we're going to use Cargo to install a bunch of these tools, uh, which will basically be the stuff that we need to uh, program the chip. So that's Cargo Embed, which you saw me run over here in the terminal a second ago. That is what we're installing here. Um, so I detail some stuff in here as well that you need to go and uh, have a look at. Um, you, there's this cargo.toml. So if you go into the cargo.toml, uh, this is how you set up your dependencies. So you need to have in here all of the different dependencies that are in here. Uh, so there's our HAL library we need to have. You need to have the Cortex-M libraries. And then this stuff is for debugging. So the RTT target and the panic RTT target is for my debugging. Um, in the embed.toml as well, you need to do some setups. You need to put in here the full name of the chip that you're using. In my case, it's SCM32F411CEU. And then this uh, X is used in here. It's usually a number, but X just denotes that it's any of that family, which is what you're supposed to put in here. You actually get a little get a compiler warning if you're uh, running that. Uh, or a, it's a, a warning from the tool that's used to communicate with the debugging pro anyway. <laughs> not super important um all the stuff you need to set up uh in here uh, for the memory you need to configure some things so this just tells you these are memory addresses so this is where the flash memory starts uh on the chip and this is where the ram starts on the chip and then you just tell it uh how many bytes basically you have so in this case, I know I've got 512k of flash memory and I've got 128k of uh, RAM. And you have to look this up uh, in the uh, data sheet for your, um, for your chip and that will uh, let you know what you need to put in here. These addresses are pretty static for most of the STM32 chips, I think. Uh, you can find it out in the data sheet if they're not, if they're different to these. But uh, a lot of the ones I've looked at, these are kind of standard memory addresses that they use. The only thing that varies tends to be the length, uh, and that will depend on the chip you're using. 
So, memory talked about, uh, chipset talked about. Oh yeah, so debugging setup then. Um, so inside here you have a few different things. Actually, this is uh, this is important. This is part of how you could program it. So this dot uh, cargo config file tells cargo what to do when you want to build it. So this tells us what uh, flags we need to apply so that it knows how to how to compile for the target that we want. Um, and it also tells us what to actually do with the uh, uh, with trying to, to run this. So this just gives us uh, some uh, config in here. Um, final thing then, I guess, is that debugging that I said uh, that I talked about. So there's two parts of this. There's the cargo embed tool that lets you do stuff, and then there's also probe or s. So when I look in, when you look in the readme here <clears throat> for setting up VS Code, you want to use this probe or s tool. What this does is uh, it can do a load of stuff. Uh, it's a standalone package that lets you integrate, it lets you interface with an STM32 ST link or an STM, ah, an ST link debugging probe, which is uh, what you use to program and debug uh, STM32s basically, uh, or most STM uh, chips. So again, I don't want to get into huge detail about how, how this works or how to set it up. There's loads of links in here. You can go read this stuff if you want. Um, but you can install this tool and then you can configure uh, a launch config in VS Code. And this will tell you what you need to do. So it gives you programming binary, tells you what to do, how it works. And based on all the other config, it then knows that it needs to go to, it needs to call uh, probe or S and then it can connect to that with the debugger and it'll give you all the nice stuff, um, which is how I was able to have my debug screen printing here in the terminal and how I was able to do interactive debugging here um, with uh, VS Code. Whew, <laughs> that was a lot. <laughs> uh, sorry, some of this is a little bit disjointed. There's a uh, whole piles of different stuff in here. It's, it's not necessarily the smoothest setup. Once you can get all of this in place, it it, wor it just works really well, um, which is fantastic. I've encountered very few issues in working with this, but it did take a little bit of time to kind of build this up and cobble together all the different uh, parts of this uh, and all the tools and stuff. I've done my best to document it in here. Um, I'll throw some resources into things in the description. And the previous video I did on this is, is kind of a rehash of a lot of stuff I talked about in that. Um, but I just want to talk about it again because I think this is cool and uh, I want to talk about the little differences with the uh, new library. So if you look at this compared to, I did a line following robot uh, not so long ago, which uses the STM32L chip that I talked about. Um, so I'll throw a link in the description for that code. You can go have a look at that code because it's it's substantially different and it's a little bit more complicated, the setup, than this code. This is a, a lot more um, succinct, uh, the code for this. And it, on this specific library uh, or this specific repository, if you go back and look at previous versions, you can see the STM32L version of this. And I think there is more code in it too. So this is a little bit more, a little bit more terse and easier to understand, which is kind of nice. Whew. Okay, that was a lot. A little bit of a brain dump, a little bit of a ramble. Uh, and yeah, I didn't even show you the LED blinking. So um, maybe I'll film some B-roll and throw that at the end here. Um, as always, uh, thanks folks for watching this and listening to me ramble. Uh, yeah, um, hopefully I'll come out with something a little bit more uh, <laughs> interesting or a little bit more uh, uh, engaging of a project after this. Uh, I'm working on a few different things at the moment, but I just wanted to record this quickly because this is something I was actively working on. And yeah, just wanted to kind of brain dump some of my current thinking about it and some of the updates to my tech stack and all that sort of stuff. So thanks everybody for watching and I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.